my name is Dimitri. I work for Canonical and I work in the foundations team on Ubuntu. And I work at integrating various things into the Ubuntu software stack, uh, mostly in early boot. And I didn't write Resolve DE, but I was one of the people who integrated into Ubuntu to be used by default on client servers, desktops, IoT, in all of our deployments by default. There are various reasons why we went to do it, um, mostly because um, DNS is hard. Um, doing DNS correctly is very hard. And also, it's very dynamic lately, such that there's constant updates in terms of name servers that you're supposed to use, and search domains that you're supposed to use, and so on and so forth. And loads of software doesn't really monitor well uh, when the networking <laughs> changes. So that's kind of our reasoning for it. Um, so what is systemd resolve d? Um, it's an optional component which is shipped uh, in the systemd software project which has loads and loads of components. It's a local caching DNS resolver. I think that's the quickest way to describe it. Um, it's a daemon. It listens on board 53 on TCP and UDP, and it offers a local resolver which will do per link DNS name resolution. And that's kind of important because uh, these days you do not have just a single DNS server which you always have <laughs> access to. You often have uh, different DNS servers depending on whether you're on Wi Fi, Ethernet, 3G, LTE, whether you roam, whether you enable or disable VPN, or your VPN dies, such that all of these things constantly change and it constantly monitors and stores configuration for every single of your network links. It also has an NSS module, so you can enable it and then you can have NSS switch resolve all of your DNS names via that as well, so you don't need to have etc resolve conf at all. So like when I worked at Clear Linux, we've tried to actually remove etc resolve conf from the file system. That didn't go that well, <laughs> but we've tried and it was fun when it did work. Um, there is a Dbus API as well, such that you can uh, uh, query the configuration, change the configuration, as well as, well as do all of the different uh, queries and resolutions via that. And there is a very handy command line tool as well, such that you can actually um, debug what's happening and get even like the binary output of your queries and so on and so forth. Um, it is a network daemon, as I said. So it is listening on port 53, which does conflict sometimes with other softwares that also wants to listen on port 53. It has a ResolveConf implementation. Some of you might be aware of ResolveConf, which is like on Ubuntu and Debian, for example, it's a lot of shell scripts which try to uh, parse loads of domain servers and just mash them together into a single file. So there is a compatibility interface for that as well inside systemd resolve D. So it's many things together under a single umbrella. So as I've said, removing ETC resolve conf is a bad idea because in practice it is a operating system ABI. So it has to have name server space something in it. And um, systemd resolve D offers you a couple of options of what you can do with ETC resolve conf. And mostly we're trying to shepherd all the queries into it. Um, there are three files that you can generally point it to. Um, the first one will point at the stub resolver on your local host, but it will also have dynamically updated search domains such that as soon as you enable VPN, you'll get all of the search domains pushed to you updated in your ETC resolve conf such that everything works. Um, there is a static file as well, which doesn't have the search domains, but it's useful for like embedded systems where you know that you will most likely not have any search domains or you don't care whether they're updated dynamically, then you can statically link to that file instead. And there is a third one, which is basically like a dump of the existing upstream name servers that Resolve D is aware of, such that it will actually have the underlying name servers there. And I'm going to show how these files look like. So this is the static one which is shipped by default in the packaging, right? It points to your local name server. It does say that it does support eDNS, such that all of the eDNS queries are 
capable. There is also pipelining support being added in master as well, such that you can do full queries as you would expect over TCP or UDP without losing anything. So this is an example from my system when I'm connected to my uh, company's VPN, such that in slash run, there is a dynam dynamically generated file, and it also includes all the search domains which I've acquired from uh, DHCP from my local Wi-Fi, uh, from search domains that I've acquired over the VPN from my company or from my VPNs for my clients as well. And the neat thing here is that when I do these queries, each one of those queries is actually rooted on the correct interface to the correct upstream name server, such that my internal VPN company uh, queries are not leaked to a different VPN, to the second one, or to the public internet. And it also means that I always get the correct answers, which I, can actually, which I actually have roots for. Um, this is the resolve conf, which is a dump of actual upstream name service, which I am currently using. So you see that I have two of them, and I have all the search domains. This will leak your DNS queries, right? Because here you have no information which one of the name servers you should use for which search domain. And you might also get NX domain results from one but not the other. And it might not be authoritative which one is the correct NX domain. <laughs> so, um, however, there are pieces of software that really cannot deal with pointing to a local host uh, resolver. So, for example, Kubernetes, they often want to know your actual upstream name server. And like from version 1.11, they've started to actually uh, look at this file to figure out which ones they should carbon copy inside their container deployments. <laughs> which is probably not a good idea because I don't think they're actually monitoring for updates because this file will be updated as your networking changes. And in the cloud, things do change because like whenever you change your tenant ID or you connect to more VPNs inside your cloud, your search domains will update dynamically and such that you have to monitor these things. So you can also not point ETC resolve conf at resolve D at all and still use resolve D else how. So your NSS module will continue to work, your command line tools will continue to work, your DBus API will continue to work, network manager will continue to push <laughs> Uh, DNS servers to Resolve D, even if your ETC Resolve Conf doesn't point at Resolve D. And one interesting thing is that in that case, Resolve D will start to use ETC Resolve.conf as an input file, such that it will parse it and it will store the name servers you've specified there by hand as the global or the default, default or the fallback DNS server if it has no other knowledge. And it's useful because this way you can revert back your system to what it was before or how it's configured elsewhere such that you can compare the two types of name resolutions. Okay. So how do we store and push all the name servers into the Resolve D? So Network Manager and Network D, they have native support for Resolve D and they push the updates via Dbus to there. Um, if you are a VPN provider or you write a new VPN software, you might use DBus API to update the name servers to Resolve D, or you can use the command line tool in like hook scripts to update the right name servers if you have that need. There is also ResolveConf uh, compatibility interface such that you can just use existing ResolveConf integration instead. And you can by hand specify things in ETC Resolve Conf, which will be read by Resolve D if it's not managed by it. So there is loads of options. There is also compile time fallbacks, which I don't quite like, but you can compile Resolve D such that it will fall back to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. <laughs> And even though you have no network connectivity, it will, like Route Robin, still try to resolve things. I don't like that because that kind of is a privacy violation and like call home and you're not using what you're supposed to use. So I'll get back, I'll get to what the defaults in Ubuntu actually are slightly later. Um, <laughs> apart from resolving um, just normal DNS queries, there are other things uh, Resolve D can do. So it can do LM 
LLMNR resolutions, uh, MDNS, you can enable and force DNSSEC, and then you kind of break your system. <laughs> because loads of people claim that they do DNSSEC and then they missign their domains. <laughs> and basically you can't resolve anything. Also, the captive portals uh, break DNSSEC quite often. Um, as I said, this is a local caching name resource. So there is a cache which your users can poison each other with, <laughs> such that some paranoid people might want to disable cache. <laughs> so this is kind of like tunables of how much paranoia you have as well. Um, DNS tab listener, so if you don't want it to bind to port 53 because you're going to run some other better software instead, uh, then you can disable uh, binding to port 53 as well. And you can ask it not to read ETC hosts because you think that's vulnerable as well and then you can disable reading that as well. So it's loads of options. Um, on Ubuntu, you see these are no by default because this is what makes internet work for people in Starbucks and in like Houston Terminal 2 and various angry bug reports that I had to read. <laughs> in terms of pair link configuration, you can see what scopes are enabled on each link. So you can say that I do not want uh, LMNR on my Wi-Fi, but I'm okay for that to be done on the Ethernet because I trust physical network more. And you can set various settings as you want on each interface. And usually it's a full list, but it didn't fit on the slide, so I split it in two columns, so the formatting is slightly modified for presentation. It shows the current DNS server. It shows the search domains and a very weird tilde dot uh, search domain. It basically means that you can force specify where you want the bulk of your search queries to go to, which specific interface link you want them to go down. You also can specify which search domains you want to be used on like a VPN connection and you also can say that you do not want anything else but your company.com resolved there. That allows you that gives you quite powerful tools to implement split DNS correctly and as expected. And most importantly, you can do this automatically if your uh, system administrator provisions those things via OpenVPN uh, Open correctly, then all of these things just happen locally on the client machine without users have to worry about whether they're doing split DNS correctly or not. Um, there are the resolve kittle command line. It was previously called systemd resolve d or resolve, but it was renamed to resolve kittle in later releases. So it depends which release of Ubuntu you're on, you might have to use one or the other. But the verbs and commands are mostly available everywhere. You can query normal A records, quadruple A records, you can query other things like open PGP keys and etc. And behind a very restrictive captive portal and then you like paid for your Wi-Fi and suddenly you get the rest of the internet and at that point you probably want to flash your caches or if you are like a system administrator or like you write GNOME software to do captive portals please do flash caches after you know you have the real internet connection because that way you can actually restore connectivity to loads of things and you can also reset server features what we found out is that loads of captive portals really do not like eDNS and sometimes they do not give you the answer to where the captive portal is unless you send the query without eDNS. <coughs> but once you got past the captive portal, <laughs> eDNS starts to work magically and suddenly DNS sex start to work and all of those things start to be passed through correctly. And that's quite scary, but that also means that sometimes ResolveD tries loads of things and it says, like, I've tried DNSSEC, I've tried eDNS, I've tried TCP, none of those things work, I'm going to use just UDP and, like, only do short queries and short packets. And after you pass the captive portal, suddenly you need to scale back up and start enabling all of the nice features like 
DNS over TLS and all of those things. Um, here are some more commands that ResolveKit will offer you and you can set loads of parameters. And well, I did mention captive portals in the EDNS, they're quite sad. We found many other bug reports as well. So like, for example, loads of providers, let's not name them by name, but they run like a big cloud. And then they abuse option 15 and they send multiple search domains there and they do it comma separated because magically that and our clients use it and we're not going to change that. So I'm, I'm thinking that maybe option 15 will need to have like non RFC parsing capability like network D and network manager, which sounds ugly, but it will make the internets work. <laughs> We've tried to enable MDNS by default and LM MNR, but unfortunately what we found out that uh, NX domains resolutions take way too long. So people make a typo or people want to resolve to make sure that something is gone from the network because they've removed a host name. And those resolutions take so long that all of the integration test suites started to time out and bomb out such that I had to disable that because otherwise like OpenStack doesn't work or Maz doesn't work or Juju doesn't work. So those things are nice on the local network, but in practice they break the internet. <laughs> And also the other query that we often get is that domainless searches are not forwarded. So <coughs> loads of people at home on their Wi-Fi, um, uh, Wi-Fi, they do not set a home domain for their local network. And then they expect for us to leak uh, domain uh, search domainless queries to the public internet and we don't do that. <laughs> and people want that to happen and we tell them, no, you're wrong. And, but they get annoyed. So if you want to resolve host names on your local network, make up a domain and, and set it, and then we'll pick it up and then we'll use it, because that's how you should be doing things. Um, Ubuntu default, we do trust the domains that we've acquired over DHCP by default, because that makes things work in cloud context a lot. But if you are paranoid or you don't trust that, you probably would want to disable that. Um, you can enable DNSSEC, you can enable DNS over TLS, and you can enforce it. Uh, you will reach very little subset of the internet, but good luck, and you can do that in your etc systemd resolve.conf to modify that and use that. Um, we listen on port 53. Uh, we do not have any fallback DNS, so we don't round robin try to reach internet which we don't have access to. Uh, we do use tab resolve conf, which I've showed earlier. We disable NSS module uh, because loads of software doesn't actually use NSS or they prefer to use etc resolve conf instead. So we kind of use the stub resolver as our default uh, point of how to do queries. Uh, we have network D, network manager, if up down integration. We will switch resolve conf implementation to resolve D soon, but we haven't done that yet. Um, in practice, this works as a default setting for a distribution well, and it covers loads of use cases. For some people, it doesn't work, and in those cases, we do recommend, well, you, you have the powers to change the symlink of etc resolve conf to point where you want it to be pointed at. Um, but then you also get to keep all the broken pieces, because this works well in Starbucks. Anything else? Possibly not. <laughs> And I think that's all for my slides. And um, ask me anything. <laughs> yeah? Do you support DNS over HTTPS? <laughs> so um, the question was whether we use DNS over HTTPS. Well, um, when do you support it? Huh? When do you support it? Whether we support it. So um, I don't think DNS over HTTP is not in Resolve D yet and we use Resolve D by default. So um, the answer is no. However, DNS over HTTP <coughs> is probably something that should be added to Resolve D project. Um, 
If it does, it's nice, because then suddenly you can point all of your system and everything on your system will use DNS over HTTPS, right? <laughs> so it's already a single point of integration. So you need to edit only once, not in every single piece of web browser that you use on your system. Yeah? Uh, so right now, opt out, let's say, is yeah. to delete result, if you see result D and write whatever there is, and then NSS picks that up. Uh, Uh, so, 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 right. So um, the question was, uh, what do I do to disable Resolve D, and how do I avoid, uh, avoid NSS taking over and redirecting my queries to Resolve D anyway? Um, so um, libnss-resolve is a separate package on Ubuntu, and it's not installed by default. So you would want to remove that package, or you would want to also use the package reconfigure NSS, whatever the command is, to disable that uh, NSS module if you have it enabled. <laughs> we did briefly enable it by default, but we have disabled that since. So it, only if you run like a development release post Xenial, you will ha may have it on your system, but in practice we don't enable NSS module by default, so it shouldn't be there. And changing etc resolve conf to not be a symlink is quite easy. I hope everybody knows how to do that. And yeah, so you do need to do two things. <laughs> Yeah. Um, has the cache poisoning been solved by now? Um, I've delegated that question to our security team, and in practice, they did risk assessment, uh, if I can call it that way. And basically, the benefits of the cache outweigh the probabilities of cache poisoning, <laughs> and it's mostly to do with local users. Uh, poisoning each other's cache <laughs> rather than um, somebody external. And also you have to be aware that Resolved internally flushes caches often whenever the network configuration changes or your links or name servers changes, it does self-flush the caches because things have changed, my world view might be different. Um, so I don't believe cache poisoning is solved, but I also don't think it's a viable thread. Is that an okay answer? <laughs> um, so the, the follow-up was that because of cache poisoning uh, possibility, Resolve D was disabled. Well, you have a config option for that, so disable caches, and then Resolve D will not cache anything and then you can use Resolve D, and you will not be vulnerable to cache poisoning, but you will also have slower queries, because each time the query will be repeated, right? Because <laughs> like in cloud context, like some of our cloud partners, they ask us to enable cache, DNS cache, because it makes the cloud faster, especially when you have multiple VMs talking to each other. So, and network there is slightly more trusted. So if you can trust your network and your connections to your upstream name server, you shouldn't worry much about cache poisoning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you want to use system D, resolve D, yeah. and, but a static uh, resolve for IP address, how do I configure it? Uh, so that, uh, the question was, uh, if I want to use a static uh, name server but still use Resolve D, where do I configure it? So in slash etc, systemd slash resolve.conf is the global configuration where you can specify the name servers you want to use. But you also need to prevent other things pushing per link configuration because that can take precedence over whatever your default system name server is. So you would disable um, Resolve D plugin in Network Manager, for example. <laughs> so yeah. you disabled DNS set by default. Yes. The internet doesn't work with it. Uh, I find that a weird assertion because every resolver I've run for 10 years has had DNSSEC on. So okay. Why? Explain. Uh, explain. <laughs> explain. Um, so um, the question was why did we disable DNSSEC by default or for now? Um, I think one of the best answers from my team <coughs> colleague was that we will not use Ubuntu to debug the internet. <laughs> <laughs> And slightly more wider uh, answer is that we have found that um, um, there are 
captive portals, middleware and network equipment which drops DNSSEC packets and that uh, even though cer uh, certain domains are signed correctly, between me and client, I cannot get all of the answers, right? That was one issue. The other issue was captive portals where DNSSEC works, but later, <laughs> such that people type in google.com, they fail to get to the captive portal, they cannot get the internet, they disable DNSSEC, suddenly they can get to the portal, and they can get to the internet, they can re-enable DNSSEC, but who does that? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but that, um, I mean, it's, it's, it takes a long time until we figure out that it really does work, right? Yeah. Because we, we start um, verifying everything from the top, and then eventually we figure out that, oh my god, I'm actually talking to DNS, so it doesn't support that. And generally, because, I mean, this, this is absolutely client focused, right? Mm -hmm. Like, this is okay. at the absolute end of the chain. Yeah. And so, um, we generally speak to cheap routers, right? And, mm -hmm. and cheap routers are really, really awful. Like, for example, even the better ones um, tend to proxy. Like they, they have their own domain where they which they answer themselves and then everything else is just uh, proxied through, right? Mm. So it has these this weird uh, behavior where depending on the domain you actually resolve, um, <laughs> it has completely different feature sets, right? So um, and then you have these mixed views on the world where you start DNS verifying half of the internet and then suddenly you end up in the other half and then everything is closed. Right? Yeah. So, um, um, I think. Uh, on the internet itself, the domains are generally fine, right? Like, because Google does uh, yeah. verify everything with, with these things, but it's just a nightmare on the, on the on And the like, uh, it cup. Can you summarize that for the mic? Uh, for the mic. Um, um, I think the answer there is that. Uh, between end client and the good internet, there's loads of shitty components in between. <laughs> um, I think that's the summary. Um, but for me also, we found loads of bug reports where people change their keys and don't resign them, their domains correctly, such that you get invalid signatures, which you're not supposed to trust, <laughs> because people played with DNSSEC, then moved on, or like Bob left, and then, you know, Things are no longer signed correctly. The worst reason you don't disable uh, validation of certificates because people have expired certificates. In, uh, you don't disable it in the browser because of that. So, I mean, security techniques. So, I, I think the browser argument is different because it's shown to people in their face, and generally people got taught to. Uh, use that well, and it's quite user visible, hence it's generally um, fixed better, as in more websites have valid certificates more often than it is the case with DNSSEC. But if DNSSEC is broken, you will see it very fast. Yeah. Um, because you, you just disappear. I'm sorry, he was the next person to ask a question. Um, regarding the cache poisoning, yeah. couldn't it be just cache per user? Um, the question about cache poisoning was whether we, would, uh, we can uh, cache per user instead. Uh, possibly that's the answer, but it has performance hits. And also, uh, what we also like to see is that when you launch thousands of containers, that they generally hit more, more or less the same CDN endpoints and things like that, because that makes connections faster. Um, so I think there is a performance uh, hit if you do per user caching. <laughs> Better than no caching. Oh, we prefer cache everything. So I think we're on that slide scale. Also, I don't think there is per user caching support yet. So maybe that's something that you might want to add to System D. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question. Answering uh, uh, from the cache, even if it's expired, so in case, for example, the upstream name server is not available at the moment? Um, I, so the question was whether there are answers available from the cache, even if you like lost network connectivity. Um, I don't believe... Uh, I don't believe. Yeah, I don't believe that that's done that way because as soon as you lose network connectivity, your cache will be flushed, and it will be deleted. So we're actually very protective there that uh, we flush uh, the cache rather too often than uh, yeah. usual because we think like uh, I mean, if the configuration changes, everything might change, right? Yeah. So and we even have rules that um, I don't know. Somebody sets a ridiculously large TCL 
we ignore it. We uh, will flush every entry after 10 minutes or something, the latest, yeah. because we say, uh, yeah, we don't want to play this game, but you end up in one network and the, and the weird uh, captive portal set to use TCL and you never get rid of that entry yeah. anymore. So we have the policy we flush too often. Yeah. So <coughs> the summary there for the mic is that Resolve D by default has aggressive cache expiry and cache flushing. No, sorry, we're done. Oh, we're done. We're really oh, okay. Thank you.